Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man. Right? A way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. God. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. Yo bros, it's Elliot Hulse here with the Elliot Hulse podcast and where we're growing stronger every day. And today I have an amazing guest, somebody who is one of the first guys I look to when I return to the faith. And, uh, and he's the author of an amazing book that we're going to talk a little bit about here today. Uh, Kennedy Hall, thank you for joining us, brother. Thanks for having me on. And, uh, Feeling is both ways. I used to watch you back in the day when we were both pagans and uh, lifting weights like crazy and watching Elliot scream into the camera. So it was funny how we ended up connecting. Yeah, the Church of Iron. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, where we go to lay our lay our sins before the power act. <laughs> That's right. And mortify the flesh. That's right. That's right. And so uh, Kennedy is the author of one of the first books that I was attracted to and read thoroughly and really loved when I returned to the faith. I have an old copy of it here. It's called Terror of Demons. And the subtitle is what drew me to purchasing this book and devouring it, Reclaiming Traditional Catholic Masculinity. So Kennedy, my first question is, well, what is traditional Catholic masculinity, right? And, and why does it need reclaiming what's going on? Well, let's let's answer the question from the ending of it first. So, why does it need reclaiming? Because look around, <laughs> our culture is like a disaster when it comes to men, um, right? You know, and I, I'm not I'm not trying to put all the you know it's an, it, when you're talking about masculinity, it's a fine line of putting the blame on the behavior of men, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that there's obviously like a system that's sort of making men that way. So it's a bit of both, right? So, um, but that's obvious. I mean, we see this in just the basic beta culture we're in. I mean, um, you, you know, you go to university campus and men are talking about uh, abortion as if it's some sort of, you know, uh, way to empowerment, but it's just because they want to get a chick pregnant and not have to do anything about it, you know, like that's, and, uh, you know, I could go on and on with the litany. We all know those things, especially the viewers of your show. Um, but in a more fundamental way too, this really affects families. It affects the church. It affects uh, children. It affects education. It affects, I mean, things like national security. I mean, look at these, these, you know, these leaders that we have. They're, you know, absolutely uh, consumed by the spirit of the age, and they make stupid decisions, and they can't stand up for the truth, and so on and so forth. So, witnessing all these things, uh, and myself, you know, being a recovering secular guy. Um, just sort of raised in the culture. I, I, you know, came back to the faith. Uh, I would have been um, uh, 25 or so, 25, 26. And, um, you know, I wanted to be a good man. We found out that we were expecting our first of five children. And uh, I was like, wow, I have to raise these kids and I have to be a good father. I don't want to, I, I don't want them, um, you know, to, 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 
recreate the same issues that I had, you know, all the classic things you get in when you're sort of inundated with the culture. So I started researching masculinity and so forth as a Catholic, and I realized, you know, there's huge, um, there's huge um, resources in pieces. So, you know, you look to a church father and you find something really cool. You look to the life of a saint and you find something really cool. You read something about a battle here and there, and it's like, well, that's really cool. But honestly, for the life of me, uh, if you look up like Catholic masculine or even Christian masculine book, it's very difficult to find something that is like, here, here's 200 pages. This is everything you need to get started. Um, so I partly just started to write it uh, out of necessity, you know, almost if I could talk about it from a business perspective, obviously as an author, I, I like what I do and I want people to enjoy it for the sake of it. But if I'm going to spend 150 hours doing something, I also want that thing to be worth my time. So I thought, well, this is probably a pretty good place to put my name out there as an author. So I did that. And as far as um, why reclaiming traditional Catholic, because the word tradition at its root means handing on what is sacred, handing, handing on what must be kept. And historically, this is how masculinity has always been handed on, you know, whether even, even in non-Christian societies, there's like an initiation ritual or something like that, you know. Um, it's just, you need to be a man, men need to teach you how to be a man. We've grown up in a culture of broken families, we've grown up in a culture of uh, a public education and all these sorts of things, and men have been browbeaten into being not masculine. So... I had to look to the past, find all these traditional teachings and wisdom, and then hand them on to, to, to continue the path. And then ultimately, wh why I did Catholic, I, I'm a Roman Catholic, and, you know, um, I believe the fullness of truth is found in the church, and, uh, you know, helping men find masculinity from the lens of the church also, I believe, tempers certain excesses that becomes something like a machismo, which is so easy to fall into um, because it's tempered by a virtue of self-sacrifice, which is the crucifixion, which we find on the cross. Um, so that's pretty much the Cole's notes of it. You know, um, before I return to the faith, uh, the term Christ, uh, Catholic masculinity almost sound like an oxymoron, right? Like when I thought ca Catholicism, I thought soft men, right? Maybe yeah. some of the soft priests that I remember from the you know 90s and whatnot. Um, where along the way did the Christian faith lose its sense of uh, masculine vigor? Huh. Mm. Well, we should just we should stay here. Um, let's look at four examples from Scripture because this is always a temptation for men. Mm. So Adam, David, Solomon, and I'm thinking of one more. Maybe I'll think of it later. Um, so Adam is created perfect, right? He literally has all the virtues, um, but he actually falls for a lust, a lustful temptation. That's what the, the offering of Eve is for him. She's naked. She's perfectly beautiful. And she offers him sin. And he accepts it. That's baked into the cake of the crux of a man, you know, of, of the difficulty. Um, King David is the... Oh, sorry, Samson's the other one, Samson. King David is the um, most pious man you could ever imagine. I mean, he wrote the Psalms for the most part. Um, and he falls for Bathsheba, you know, that, that crack in his armor, this great warrior, causes him to um, essentially have his best friend murdered so he can bed his wife. I mean, talk about going off the rails. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then Solomon, his son, in inherits this, this iniquity. Um, and he has like a thousand concubines, you know, ends up dying a pagan or, or worshiping the, the pagans, at least with the pagans. And then Samson is the strongest man ever to live. Right. And he falls for Delilah, you know? What about Ahab? So this is, That's another example too. Oh right? yeah. You can keep, keep going with it. Yeah. It's, it's all there. <laughs> um, so, so this temptation to give into our vices is always mm. there, especially those of the flesh. Now. The church understands this, and, and a book that I'll recommend to people to read is The Everlasting Man by G.K. Chesterton, and it's a concise history of mankind culminating in the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. 
and it's an amazing book. It's like reading history as if it's a story, because it is, but he writes it like a storyteller. And uh, with the Chestertonian wit that only he has. And he talks about how, you know, we're told that we're told that that period after the Roman Empire, they call it the Dark Ages, right? Right. And he says, no, no, this is the age of purification. All of Christendom had to go into the monastery because all of Christendom had to be purified from the decadence of the Roman way of life. And the church understands this. So she's always continued up until the last 50 or 60 years with these very difficult disciplines where we are fighting against the weaknesses of our flesh through fasting and penances and abstinence and all these sorts of things. So I guess, you know, how did it get to the point where now we're in this position where basically it's a very sad state of affairs for Catholic priests, also in Protestant denominations as well. They'll tell you they have issues as well. And and really, I mean, this sort of un, this this perfect storm of life becoming so much more comfortable due to technological advancements, which we embrace in many ways, and many of them are very good. Well, at the same time, the church has basically given up requiring discipline of her faithful. Uh, and this, is, you know, you, it should almost be the opposite. Go, coming into an age of comfort and excess, we should be doing more penance. You know, uh, back in the 1800s, Pope Leo XIII, I believe it was, he lessened the Lenten penances and abstinence of the people because the Catholic population had spread across the globe outside of Europe and was in these non-Catholic cultures. Um, and, you know, in America, your employer, if you're a Polish immigrant in 1897 or whatever, he doesn't really care that it's Lent and you have to fast till three o'clock. you got to work a 12-hour shift because there's somebody else who wants your job. So Leo XIII was like, hey, your life's already hard enough. <laughs> so we'll temper your penances a bit and you can use tallow or beef broth or something like that to give you a little bit of strength. Um, that made sense. That made sense because there was already a difficulty going on that was making the people virtuous. But now we live in a time where we don't have any challenges physically anymore uh, in the way that we used to. Uh, and now we don't have any disciplines. And we've seen this reflected in the priesthood. You know, it used to be the case, it still is in the traditional orders, uh, both for religious like nuns and for priests, where you can't even enter into the congregation or the society of apostolic life or whatever it is, unless you can prove basically under oath that you have three years since your last impure sexual dalliance, whether with yourself or with another person. And things like this used to be the norm. So you could understand that the people coming into your orders had a virtue built into them, but now it's just not, the standards aren't there. What are some of the disciplines, um, penances you use, bulwarks that the church had traditionally upheld that uh, kept men strong? Yeah. Um, well, I'm right now doing, you know, um, the Exodus 90. I, it's more of an Exodus 70. If people, don't, if people know what that is, uh, it's 90 days until Easter. You basically do a bunch of penances. I started 70 days before with some friends. Just we had that was what we decided. But um, so you know, fasting, um, fasting in the in the sense of how the church understands it. Um, obviously, the the basic definition of fasting, which you've talked about a lot, means to not eat at all. Um, but for a sustainable way of implementing it into your life, you basically just severely reduce your calories for significant periods of time. Okay. So for example, today's an ember day, a traditional ember day in the church. It's not an obligation. We call them a holy day of opportunity. And um, so I'm doing, you know, what you would call partial fasting and abstinence. So I, I've had very little food today, you know, just a little bit of bread or something at lunch. Um, and then I'll just have a smaller meal with no meat at supper. You know, it's doable. It's tough, you know, especially when you're used to you know, excess. Uh, but, you know, I basically am doing a lot of this throughout Lent. Um, and, uh, you know, no snacking, no no food between meals, no sweets, no alcohol, except for, you know, cheat thing here on Sundays. Cold showers, doing cold showers right now. I've been doing that for a while. Um, personally, I committed to um, doing um, 40 burpees every day, sort of the military style. It's not a huge amount, but it's like four seconds, four minutes of hell. And, uh, you know, you just, you just get after it. So that way, if I can't work out, at least I've done something really hard. Um, and, um, yeah, basically those are the main things. I was really pleased by one of the interviews you did, uh, a couple of weeks ago on your channel, 
Uh, you had, I believe his name is Matthew Police. Uh, he yeah. right, he wrote a book about traditional Catholic fasting, and it was interesting to discover that there are, you know, I kind of boiled it down to about four major fasting seasons, uh, including Lent, in the faith, and it seems almost as if uh, living a penitential lifestyle was the norm at some point, you know, before all these um, eases were made. So we have fasting, right? And traditional fasting would mean that, I think he mentioned that there were saint days uh, to fast. Um, There were also uh, some Marian fasts. Um, And, you know, of course, fasting up to, I didn't realize that 40 days before Christmas was a fasting season as well, you know, that included Advent. So we have fasting for sure, and of course that was a, 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 a practice of the ancient church, uh, as old as uh, as old as, as as the faith. Um, what are some other? Well, first let's unpack what penance means, right? Sometimes you use that word with uh, various Christian denominations, and they 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 would argue that well, you're trying to work your way into heaven with these penances. What are penances, and why does the church prescribe them? Sure. Well, penance. So this is the same root word for a penitentiary. Mm. So this is in the past, you need to go to jail to do penance. <laughs> That's what it meant. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> it's a matter of the natural, it's a matter of the natural law. So we know this just from Greek philosophy, for example, you give every man what is due to him and that's justice. Um, so when you do something to harm a man, you give him if you can you give him back what you took or you build what you destroyed you know whatever and then as a part of restitution you do a little extra to make up for his suffering and this is the basis for all legal systems okay so penance is we are sinners um and we offend god by our sin and because we actually can't repair that gap because it's existential. Christ had to do it. So as a way of uniting ourselves to Christ's sufferings, you find this in, um, it's either Colossians or Romans. I always forget the book where St. Paul says, I unite, I, I provide what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And a lot of people go, whoa, I mean, Protestants have a hard time with that. I mean, they have a way of talking about it, but it's a difficult one because it's like, well, what could be lacking? And it's not that anything is insufficient in Christ's sacrifice. It's that he opened the gate for us. He paid the ultimate price we couldn't pay for a debt that he didn't owe. But we keep racking up the credit card, so we got to do something about that. So penance is a way of um, orienting yourself towards a, a, a sense of justice and repaying what you can to God for your sins. And that's a, that's the basic level, is it's justice. It's just, I did something bad, I've got to make restitution for it. This is a natural law. But one of the benefits of it is, is that um, we grow, hopefully, we grow in virtue by doing it, so we sin less. You're supposed to come out of your, you're supposed to come out of your penitentiary not wanting to be a criminal anymore. <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen the way that the system is now, but that's the idea. Um, so that's, so, so, so penances, you know, then you can take on voluntary penances because this is an imitation of Christ as well. He didn't sin. He didn't have to do anything. Everything he did was a voluntary penance for us. So yes, if we go to confession and we get a penance from the priest, we're required to do that as part of the absolution. That's fine. But then, you know, why are you fasting for 40 days, you know, and, and not eating meat, let's say up to Lent? It's like, we're well, not, are you sinning every day that requires that? It's like, no, but I provide what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. People are still sinning today. And if I want to unite myself to the cross, I can offer up my sufferings for other people as well so that they may be forgiven as well and, and grow in virtue. So that's sort of the the basis of what a Catholic understanding of penance is. I- uh, absolutely, I agree that um, doing hard things makes a man a man. Um, this is why we're attracted to different challenges and things of that nature um, and are very willing to embrace fasting in somewhat. Uh, you read some of the Old Testament stories of, you know, the wearing of sackcloth and hair shirts and 
uh, dousing yourself with ashes and things of that nature. You don't see too many people doing stuff like that any longer. Um, are there other penances that are, I don't want to say are approved by the church, but maybe um, we get examples in the saints or things that, uh, you know, are traditional as a means to, you know, unite our suffering to Christ and grow uh, in virtue as men? Yeah, so some more extreme penances that are available for people in like religious congregations or under the direction of the spiritual director. There, I forget the names of them, but you know, there's a thing you can wear around your thigh, and it's basically like a steel um, bracelet, and it's just very uncomfortable, <laughs> and it has like bumps on it. And um, there are still hair shirts. Um, the Franciscans, the traditional Franciscans, when they are um, joining their religious order, they sleep on a board, uh, like just like on a wooden board for sleeping. They don't get a pillow or anything. They have a blanket. Uh, and they have to sleep in their habit and they're required to wear the blanket. And even when it's like, you know, whatever it is in Fahrenheit, like 90 degrees or whatever, um, things like that. But these are things that um, there's there's also um, a temptation for pride mm. with these penances. Mm -hmm. You know, look at me. I can sleep on a board. I must be extremely holy. Right. And if a spiritual director, if he senses that at all, he'll say you can't can't do that um so yeah there, there's definitely some things that some saints have done there's even still like it's you know there'll be some in, they'll, they'll, they'll whip themselves and stuff you know like you find this um but again it has to be under the direction of a spiritual director um and and and, it, and it's very rare that people do that and it was rare in the old testament it's just that we hear about it like you know the high priest is doing it and like the you know well, that makes sense that he's doing it, right? But it wasn't, or or a prophet shows up and Jonah shows up and says, Nineveh is going to fall into the sea if you don't do this. It's like, okay, well, we're going to do this, you know, but it's not like an everyday occurrence. Yeah, that's definitely something I've fallen into when I first started fasting. It was, you know, a matter of like, how tough can I be? How strong am I? Look at me. I can fast this long. Um, what are some of the ways or, you know, um, positions of the heart postures of the heart that we can adopt to avoid uh, the pride that comes with, you know, being tough guys. And then, you know, instead of seeing it for what it is as a penance, uh, looking at it as if, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a competition or something. Yeah, I guess um, for every man, he would have to distinguish between, well, he would have to figure out why he's doing something. And then, let's put it this way. Uh, you know this as a man who's been working out for a long time. One of the most difficult things you can do is less. <laughs> like, you know, I want to just like, I just watched Pumping Iron. I'm going to go do that, you know, mm -hmm, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like you just, you want to do more, you know. And I'm 34, I'll be 35 in a few weeks. And and I'm not, uh, I'm not near the arthritic age, but I am feeling some of my football and rugby injuries. And, um, you know, I, ha it's very difficult for me to tell myself, maybe just don't do that today because you don't need to do that today. And ironically, it's very much, a an exercise in humility, you know, in, in a sense. So I would say to make sure that we're fasting and doing penances properly, have, we have to have enough self-reflection to go, I need to finish this marathon because it's not a sprint. I can't do, you know, like I'm not the world's best faster. I can do the, like I've done the, uh, you know, like I'll do like Ash Wednesday or like like Mardi Gras evening till Thursday. Like I'll do like the 40 hour fast or something like that. Like I can do these things. I'm not, I don't like it. I'm not the world's best at it. Um, but I know like, for example, if I was to try to take on a 1700s Lent, and basically be vegan and not eat till three o'clock every day. Like my poor children would suffer immensely being around me. <laughs> right. You know, so I'm not going to do that. Right. So I just, you got to take the whole thing and, and then, and then, and be okay with doing less. It's funny. I remember reading one of the stories of the desert fathers and uh, I remember two monks came to their teacher and uh, he was asking them about their fasting. And one, uh, one monk says, uh, you know, I fast, Every 48 hours I eat, I eat every other day. And, the, and then so the teacher asked the other one, well, how, what is your fasting rule? And he says, well, I eat every day. 
And he turns to me and he says, you do better. He says, it's better that you fast every day, not every other day. And it was kind of an oxymoron. You would think, oh, he's not doing it as tough. And he goes on to explain, you know, the very thing that we're talking about here, which yeah, is yeah. Uh, you can you can absolutely fall into uh, uh, the vice of pride. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, uh, it's interesting because I, may, I found my way back to the faith through, uh, just like you, uh, the discovery of what's lacking in masculinity as a whole today. And there's a huge movement. There's a big movement. There's a lot of big players that are, you know, calling men back to quote unquote masculinity, but it looks different than Catholic masculinity. What would you say are some of the, the, the differences between the, uh, you know, the secular popular idea of masculinity, particularly today, you know, with the red pill ideology and whatnot, and what a, a truly masculine Catholic man would look like. Yeah, so <laughs> this is like the Andrew Tate, you know, kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I know a lot of people like him. And he, hey, he says a lot of things, and a lot of things he says are good. I get it. Mm -hmm. um, here's what I would say. I, I'm going to use a, a different analogy or another realm where we see something similar. So we see in a, in a lot of young people... Um, the red pill, like you say, when it comes to politics. So a lot of people are like, wow, this drag queen story hour thinks crazy. Whoa, what's with these forced vaccinations? You know, Biden's senile. Look at Trudeau, he's an idiot. You know, you know, like they just all these things and they share these reels and they're totally awake to the problems of liberalism. But they don't know how to replace them. So they pretty much have a political philosophy based on negativity. They have a political philosophy based on hatred. And there's a place for proper hatred. I hate the devil very much, and that's okay, because he's you should hate him. Um, but you see this where it becomes almost like a political philosophy of despair. It's like, well, we're going to hell in a handbasket because all these liberals are a bunch of morons. Right. Uh, and I'm just going to share reels showing that all day. Look at all the libs of TikTok or whatever. You know? <laughs> right. You know, the same thing can happen with men. So you realize that the culture is against you. You realize that, you know, feminism is a bad thing. You realize all the things. And you basically have a choice to make. Will you go your own way, which is literally men going their own way, right. and just sort of say, well, I'm just going to get mine because the world's stacked up against me. James Bond seems like a good option. Or... Will you say, okay, well, there must be a meaning to this suffering. Um, so what am I going to do so that this doesn't happen again? And this is where tradition comes into it. Because tradition is passing on what we've been given. If you're upset, which you have right to, the right to be, that the tradition of masculinity, masculinity was not passed on to you, then the response is to rebuild it and pass it on. And in order to pass on a masculinity that will stand the test of time, it has to be eternal in its inspiration. It can't just be based on working out, and working out is great, obviously, but it can't just be based on these things that are characteristics of men. It has to be based on what is longstanding and founda foundational for the order of the human race. And you find this in the church. Yeah, I think one of the words to describe that might be generativity. And to be a man is to be uh, generative, to be thinking of other than ourselves rather than me getting mine. It's a matter of, you know, how am I, like Christ, sacrificing maybe something comfortable or something pleasing to my ego uh, for the betterment of others. Um, let's talk for a moment about uh, a term that I love that uh, a mutual friend, Timothy Gordon, uh, woke me to, and I really love it. It's uh, weaponized chastity. You know, how, how is chastity a masculine virtue, and how does it bring things back into right order? Okay, this is perfect. Uh, so this is one of the difficult bits of the Old Testament. Why are they circumcised? So that's because that's where we need to be cut down a bit. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, you know, it's a pre, pre it's a, it's a, it, there's a lot. I mean, why don't they cut off a little piece of the ear? That skin is not right. an organ. I mean, right, seriously, lots of things. Um, because that's at the heart of the fall of the human race is lust. Um, 
anyway, so every man, every man is like a recovering alcoholic when it comes to lust. Every single man that's ever lived. And you find with um, alcoholics or addicts, let's use alcoholics because it's, it's, it's okay to drink ca casually. Some people who had a drinking problem get to the point where they in the future can actually enjoy a beer. I remember having a friend who was in the military and he wasn't really an alcoholic in the sense of like, it wasn't just like he was going to ruin his life, but he lost some buddies in Afghanistan and it was just hard and he was drinking seven, eight beers a day just as a medication, right? And he, But he was able to get over that and he was able to get to having a beer on a Saturday night if he wanted to. So every man suffers from this this predilection of 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 being a, a recovering lustaholic let's put it that way this is the way the human race falls so if we can control that then we win and we know that we win if we control this because if you look at every single weapon of the marxists of the revolutionaries of the french revolution of the the communists of the all the ists all the different you know enemies of the church and enemies of god it's always accompanied by sexual perverse perversion. And this is what St. Paul even says. My Bible's over there, but I memorized it, I think. Uh, in the book of uh, Romans, it's chapter 1, it's verses 18 through 25 or 26, something like that. And he literally goes through how a society actually descends into homosexuality and destruction. And it begins with idolatry and scientism. It goes to sexual libertinism, which is followed by environmentalism, which is followed by uh, homosexuality, which is followed by rampant disease in the culture. This is in the scriptures. This is the game plan of how sin works to destroy the human race. So at the heart of that is our chastity. So if a man can be in control of his passions, and, and they're good passions, it's good for a marriage for this to be strong. Um, it brings about the human race. It brings about a bond between the spouses. It, 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 um, it's, it's, it's a romantic thing. These things are good. Um, so if we can control this, then the Marxists can't do anything to us because everything that they throw at us, absolutely everything, somewhere in its mechanism is based on men not being able to control their sexual appetites. This is, the, this is the heart of feminism. Why do men embrace feminism? Because they embrace fornication. Hmm. They couldn't give a dang if a woman votes. They don't even want to vote. Voting's stupid half the time. I don't, you know, like, you know, people say, should women have the right to vote? Almost nobody should have the right to vote. Most people can't even, like, do their taxes, let alone figure <laughs> out how to do a country's taxes, you know? Um, so it's not about that. It's about, or should a woman have a right to work? Well, if a woman has a right to work, it's not about working. It's about, well, now she's independent. Now she can afford her own apartment. Now I can fornicate with her. Now she can have her own car. It's all baked into the cake and they throw this stuff at us. So if we can control uh, our, our, our vice in that sense, then we literally beat communism. You know, um, even before, I, I guess I could say this masculine awakening that is in its infancy, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, adolescent mindset associated with it. And I'm sure it's going to grow. It's going to get better. It only can. Even before that, you know, there was a lot of blame of Eve, right? It was Eve's fault. And you begin to see that now where men are blaming women. They're saying, oh, it's women's fault. Um, you know, even discovering the roots of the sexual revolution and all that. Oh, if women did this or women didn't do that. Um, in a way, that's a cop out. What do you what do you say in terms of our responsibility as men? You know, is, is it our fault or should we take some other blame here, or is it is it right to point it point out Eve and, and women's uh, you know how how unlawful and diabolical women behave today? Well, there's a chapter in my book or a part of a chapter called the blame game, and mm -hmm. I talk about how effeminate men start to blame women, and why it's because it's easy, it's easy to blame women. Um, so here, there's a two two sided answer to this. From a matter of strict justice. No matter if a man or a woman sins, they both sin. And this is, it's, it's the, the, the blame is as much as the blame is just because of what has happened. It doesn't have to do with your gender. Right. But on the other hand, scriptures tell us that God gave Adam dominion and Eve is his helpmate. 
Mm. She has dominion over creation, but she does not have dominion over Adam. So there is an aspect there where there's a a level of extra responsibility. So if we look at these movements like feminism and stuff, they're always pushed by men behind the scenes. Um, You know... Uh, the the fellow who who coined the term sex cells, Edward Bernays, right? He was, I think he was a cousin or a second cousin or something of Freud. It was a man, you know, it was a man finding a way to make this Madison Avenue models walk down the road with scantily clad and smoke cigarettes or to sell cigarettes. Um, so sure, we can all be blamed for our individual sins. Um, but this goes back to the scriptures. I mean, what is, um, what is Eve's punishment? that you will have, you'll desire your husband, but he will rule over you. Um, basically, it's not a punishment that her husband's going to rule over her. What it is, is the dichotomy of she wants him to be the leader, but the fact that he is causes her stress and pain because there's a disordered relationship there between men and women. So it's our job as men to reclaim this natural order and by doing so, um, again, it's not that the women's sins are our fault, but we have to admit that we perpetuate them by indulging in them. Like, for example, you know, we had a men's conference a couple of weeks ago here, uh, the Canadian Martyrs Men's Conference, and it was wonderful. It was a smashing success. It was absolutely amazing. And we had a guy doing a quick presentation. He's a pro-life counselor. He just, he wasn't one of the speakers, but he kind of did a 20-minute thing just talking about his ministry and if, how we could help him and stuff. And, you know, I got on the microphone as the MC after, and I said, you know, there is abortion because of weak men. Women don't go, yes, there's exceptions. There are some crazy women who are possessed by Satan and want to kill their babies and believe they're killing babies. But this whole mechanism behind abortion is so much deeper than that. And, you know, the culture that we embrace as men and facilitate and and propagate and perpetuate leads to abortion. So I guess that's I guess if we fit, clean up our act, to be honest, if we clean up our act, women will follow. So even if it's not necessarily our fault or it's not their fault, it's on our shoulders to fix it. I think I would say. Yeah, I remember uh, in one of Father Ripperger's lectures, he talks about how it was Adam's fault that he allowed this serpent into the garden. He says it was uh, yes. his lack of protecting his wife, and you see that a lot with men today, where this you know whole call for liberation for women is really uh, white knighting and simping so that they can get the pleasure that they want from these women. Yeah. It seems as if uh, there are so few um, really truly masculine men today, uh, you know, that are upholding that position with righteousness. I love the name of your book. I love the title, Terror of Demons. Uh, It just sounds cool. And then I discovered that that is one of St. Joseph's titles by reading your book. Um, It turns out that there are a lot of really amazing masculine saints, examples that we can follow. Um, Maybe you could tell us a little bit about why you chose St. Joseph as uh, as that icon for the title of your book, and maybe some other examples of Catholic saints that uphold that masculine identity in its fullness. Sure. Well, St. Joseph, I chose... Um, St. Joseph is a very important part of my life. Um, my birthday is March 18th, and I was born just just before 5 p.m. For those who under, for those who know, the liturgical day starts at 4 p.m. So I was born uh, on the vigil of St. Joseph. Um, my middle name is Joseph, uh, two middle names. One of them is Joseph. My no-no, God rest his soul, he's one of the men I dedicated the book to, Giuseppe Vianni, Joseph Vianni. He was a, a great man. My mom's an Italian immigrant, and he was her very hardworking, traditional father. Um, I just love that man to pieces, and I miss him every day. He died a few years ago. And, um, and, and Joseph, he raised Christ. I mean, he raised God. <laughs> That's just that's just crazy, you know. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we, Christ has divine and human nature, but he was chosen by God to raise God. It just blows my mind. It blows my mind the amount of virtue this man must have had. 
So that's a basic reason why. And then I wrote the book in 2019. I started writing this. I was a teacher at this point. I was, I was subsequently canceled. Um, hmm. But at this point, yeah. But, You're in good uh, company, apparently. There's a lot of that yeah. happening. There's a lot of that, yeah. I was actually reprimanded by the uh, government of Ontario, the Ministry of, uh, or the um, Ontario College of Teachers, I should say. It's a licensing body. And I recorded it. I have it somewhere. But it was um, your beliefs buttressed by Catholic doctrine constituted abuse for the students. And I was teaching in a Catholic school. So hmm. anyway. But um, so I, was, I wrote this book when I was still a teacher. And I wrote it in about six weeks. It was just like fury. Just poof, get the thing out. Poured out. Yeah, it was time, you know. Um, and then I didn't know what to call it. The original title that I was going to call it would have been a terrible title, and it was a different sort of man. And the reason it was because I heard some sermon where some priest was calling for not just a man, but a different sort of man. I thought, like, oh, that makes sense. But that was just the working title. I went to a retreat in November of that year, a few weeks after I wrote the book. And I was in a chapel, and there was um, a beautiful image of the Holy Family. And a very virile, young, healthy-looking St. Joseph, which is how he would have been. Um, and uh, I was just praying. I was like, what should I call the book? And uh, Terror of Demons just came into my mind over and over and over again. I couldn't shake it. And I was like, well, there's your answer. And uh, so I decided to call it that. And that's how it became Terror of Demons. And it turned out to be great for marketing because Terror of Demons just sounds really cool. But it's yeah. also like the coolest thing you could ever call anybody. Yeah. <laughs> And um, and then as far as some uh, great saints, so I talk about the Canadian martyrs in the book. Mm -hmm. And um, man, these French, I mean, they were French and, and some of them died on what is today American soil. But at that time it was New France. And and, and um, they were called uh, Canadien. That meant a French settler of, of uh, British North America or of, of New France. So that's why they're called the Canadian martyrs historically, even though some died in the States. Um, but, um, you know, they got on boats to sail across the Atlantic ocean in a short window where the weather was good enough to do so, knowing that death was like a 25% chance just on the voyage or whatever the crazy numbers would be, came to a land where people died of scurvy and frostbite, like it was going out of style, um, and decided to go and just immerse themselves in the culture of the natives, learn their languages, learn how to eat their foods and make their crafts and things. And and uh, they were martyred. There, there was lots of success for sure, but the martyrdoms of, of St. Isaac Jogue and his companions and St. John de Brebeuf, they were unspeakable what happened to them. And they persisted. And after they were martyred like that, more missionaries came, you know, um, my country of Canada, you know, it's known for the stupidity of, you know, Justin Trudeau and stuff now, but it actually has a, a very glorious Catholic history, not just in French speaking Canada, but in the rest of it as well. And these martyrs, these Jesuits, especially that went across the country, they were, they were superheroes. And, and, you know, I know how cold it is here. I'm pretty cold, you know, right now there's a lot of snow outside and I have, I've got nice polyester jackets and, and insulated boots and a car with heating in it and stuff. And these guys are like in a cassock, you know, with like, I don't know, what were they wearing? Like leather shoes and, you know, and they, you know, scarves and they're on these canoes uh, when there's ice on top of the water. And like, it's just, I can't imagine how amazing these men would have been. So those are probably my go-tos. You, uh, you're a manly man, played football, you lift. Got a big old beard, <laughs> wearing your 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 plaid like a Canadian. You probably chop wood, don't you? If I have to, sure. <laughs> uh, one of the story. I mean, you open up with this, and one of my favorite stories is hearing how. Well, of course, like myself, you were a secular man living living the YOLO life, but you had an experience with your football coaches that I think was so touching. And how, you know, it really shows how important it is to have these uh, examples of strong men. But not only that, you saw something in these men that uh, humbled you and opened your heart to the church and to Christ. Would you be willing to uh, just share that story with sure. us? Yeah, so I was, um, 
I went to Catholic Central High School in London, Ontario, and and we were football is pretty big in Canada. I know it's not like quad five A Texas. It's you know, um, but we were pretty good, and we 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 went and played a team in Detroit every year, Detroit Catholic Central, who they were they were the quad A state champs one year. We had a pretty good game with them one time, and uh, we were a good team, and and we won a lot of championships, and it was a big deal. And we were the Crusaders, okay. So that I always thought that was so cool, and, yeah. and you know. I mean, I'm 30, again, I'm thir- almost 35 and I'm, it's funny how much things have changed. You know, political correctness was not really there in the way that it is now, not even close when I was in school. I graduated in 06, 07, somewhere around there. And I mean, I remember writing a paper for history class on, on why it was cool that the Crusaders beat a Muslim army. And I, you know, I passed and didn't get in trouble, you know, um, you know, it was okay for us to to be into that. And, and I don't know, I guess there was enough of the old guard left and whatever, but, um, so we had to play in the semifinals for let's call it state provincial, let's just call it state We're in the semifinals for state. And, um, it was supposed to be on a Saturday, but it got snowed in because this game was like December 3rd or something like that. And they couldn't get there. So that, so it got rescheduled for the next day and we never played on Sundays. Um, but our coach had a tradition where we had to go to mass before the game, every, every game day. So this happened to be Sunday. So we usually went to like a morning mass and it was a quick, you know, daily mass, but this was Sunday mass. So we go to the cathedral for mass downtown. And because of this, all the coaches who were going to mass anyway, bring their families with them. And it was a bigger deal. And, um, we would, ha- we had to wear our, our, suit jackets with the insignia of our team on and stuff and sit in this place and we get a special blessing from the priest. It was a whole thing. So we're in there in this cathedral and it's like, it's a big deal. And the buzz about the Catholic central team is going to the semifinals and it's all this nervous energy. And then I see my coaches come in and these three men, one of whom was six foot five, was actually a very big man, but even though they weren't, other ones weren't huge, they were larger than life to me. And, um, and they knelt down to pray like you do when you go to mass and do the sign of the cross and close your eyes and just do what Catholics do. And I remember looking at them and just being completely struck by how it was like they were standing taller when they were on their knees. I couldn't believe it. And I didn't, this wasn't like, I didn't like give my life to Christ right after that. I was right. kind of agnostic, but I, that always stuck with me. It always stuck with me. And then when it came time to decide on what I want to do as a career, I was sort of agnostic still. And I wanted to teach in my old high school. And I had to click this uh, button, this like toggle switch on the application form online to teach in the Catholic system and go through the college for that. And I was like, I owe it to those men. Um, I owe it to those men to give the faith a try because they're better men than I am and they believe it. And that was basically it. It's so important for young men to see tough Christian men today, men that they can look up to, uh, that humble themselves before the cross. I even had a call yesterday with a young man who, you know, he was inquiring about this. He said, I want to be Christian, but where are the guys like you? So he was admiring me in that way. And I, I, I took it humbly, but uh, he wanted to know why is it that there's such softness amongst men and where are those examples like you saw and that definitely opened your heart because men do need to see that you want to know where are those examples it's interesting uh your, your football team was called the crusaders you mentioned the crusades in your book towards the end um i even hit you up i sent you a text message after reading that because i you opened my eyes because i was brought up with the idea that this was uh evil it was a it was an error of the church it was a bad idea. And then, you know, it's one of the things that when you bring up the Catholic Church, amongst others, people will be like, well, what about the Crusades? Well, apparently we've been given maybe uh, the false impression of what it was. And uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the truth behind the Crusades, maybe to reinvigorate this idea of, of being a Catholic warrior, that, that Christian men can carry a sword and feel proud. Yeah. So... Um, first thing, first thing, the Crusades are a part of our church history, uh, not just church history, but the history of our Christian civilization. So it's not as if we need to believe like as a matter of de fide dogma that every possible thing any crusader or general ever did was fine. But the Crusades were 
one of the most heroic thing that any culture has ever done in the history of the human race. The and and you know the Muslim the the Islamic caliphates and so forth. Islam did not spread through preaching. It was spread by the sword. And after a series of a, a, a significant amount of time, the holy places of Christianity were overtaken by bloodshed. And they were occupied by people who persecuted Christians. And after about 400 years, finally, people think it was some aggression. We're talking 400 years. The Pope finally said, men, we got to do something about this. And the reason was, it wasn't, a, a, the, the intention was not a written initially to go and just like conquest the land for reasons of conquest. It was right. because there was, a, there was a, a, a handshake agreement where pilgrims could at least go to the Holy Land and they would be unmolested. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't be a, a hurt. But then the Islamic powers that be got rid of that agreement and were just slaughtering Christians who were just going to Jerusalem to pray. And they said enough is enough. And basically, the men of Christendom left everything behind, paid for their own. It wasn't like the, the people think, oh, the church had all these armies. There were papal states with armies, but this is not what the Crusades were. It was men who, it was basically militias. You know, I mean, it, we, it was kind of in a, in a sense like the American Revolution. You know, I think these men are heroes because they just were farmers and whatever, and they just fought. And it's like, yeah, they, that's heroic. This was this this was even more so. This was this was an entire civilization of men who decided to go, and um, they had many victories and they had many defeats. Um, but there are many of them who they died as martyrs for the faith, and we'll never know their names. But God willing, we'll see them in heaven because they were willing to say goodbye to their wife and children. And their wives were willing to say goodbye to them because they understood that everyone, every man will die. And if you could die swinging a sword for God, then that's a good death. And that's who the Crusaders were. Amazing. And, you know, I guess we could venture to say that, well, Christendom in itself was built by men like this. Uh, the entire Western civilization, right, what we know of Western culture was built by heroic men, brave men that were willing to stand up and fight back and do the right thing. Uh, seems we've lost a lot of that sense. Um, there's, there's hatred, uh, self-hatred. Um, you know, Western men, American men are, are taught to hate themselves. Um, as, a, as a Catholic, I was, a, I was baptized as a Catholic. I was taught to hate the church. There've been a lot of changes, a lot of, a lot of, perversions that have happened in terms of our history, but also in the church itself. And I know uh, that you're a traditional Catholic. And that's, a, that's a, you know, I say that literally, uh, you go to a traditional Latin mass, you, you, you practice the traditional faith. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between what we see today in our liturgy and even just the um, the spirit of uh, modern Catholicism um, up against what you know to be and practice as the traditional Catholic faith. Sure. So there's an expression, all grace flows into the world from the altar. So if you look at a world that has gone awry, it's because something went awry in the church first. Mm. The reason why the sexual revolution happened is because the revolution in the church happened in the 1960s. So, <sighs> traditional Catholicism is Catholicism. It doesn't mean that if people don't go to the Latin Mass, they're not good people. I'm not saying anything like that. Mm -hmm. But this tradition of 20 centuries is God's will. And this revolution that happened in the church is not God's will. And it's been made manifest by the fact that it's been an abject failure. Right. And one of the greatest problems with this revolution has been the change to the liturgy. Now, the liturgy does not have to be the exact same as it was a thousand years ago. That's never been the case. There have always been prudential and organic refinements and modifications. 
Um, but this wholesale change that happened in the 1960s and early 1970s was not in line with anything that has ever happened in the history of the church. And <clears throat> the this is a whole other show on its own, mm-hmm. but the but the background to what inspired these changes in the liturgy really was a liberal Protestant and secular Protestantism and a secular humanism. This is why the priest turned around so he could face the people because he was offering it um, to the people. That's the impression. It's not offered to God. It's offered to you. Um, he, you know, uh, he doesn't turn, people say, well, I don't want to go to the old mass because I don't want to face the priest's back. And it's like, no, you're both facing God. Right. You know, I mean, if you were on a, um, if you were on a, uh, ship and the captain was facing the front of the ship and you were behind him working, you wouldn't say, Hey, look around and face us. Right. Say, good. You know, you can see where you're going. Please keep looking that way. (laughs) Right. You know, and that's what the liturgy was always like. And actually, if you walk into churches, traditionally, they actually look like ships inside. Um, That's the way they're built. They're the Ark. It's the Ark of Salvation. Um, Anyway, so these these changes have been a disaster um, at an institutional level, and they won't last. They'll go away one day. They have to because they're not sustainable. Um. But the impression for men, you know, has been the priesthood is something that is effeminate. Um, who wants to be a priest if you're going to be a showman, right? I mean, that's not why you'd be a priest. You'd be a priest because you want to be another Christ. And to be another Christ is to focus only on God and to disappear into the liturgy. And in the old mass, the vestments and the way the priests act and the, the way the altar is made and things, the priest almost disappears. You don't look at him. You're looking at Christ. Um also, you know, uh, this is why, for example, modesty in dress is a big deal in the traditional faith. Um, nothing is, modesty does not just mean covering up, but it means, you know, dressing in a way that is in accordance with your station. You know, it's immodest for the king to walk in wearing sweatpants if he's, a, if he's visiting a dignitary. Right. Um, it's okay for the king to wear sweatpants to bed and play with his children, you know. Um, that's, the fi- that's fine for that setting. In, this, in a similar way, in the new mass and in the changes changes to the mass, there's no modesty because nothing is nothing is covered up. So how you know again, people ask, well, where did this sexual revolution come from? It came from this. If the most sacred thing on earth, where all the graces in the flow into the earth from the altar, if that thing becomes immodest, where nothing is left sacred, then the people will act that way in the culture. So we have to re- we have to reclaim these traditions in the church. It's the only way forward. Yeah, so, you know, I returned to the church. I knew nothing of a difference between a Novus Ordo Mass and a, and a traditional yeah. Mass. Um, probably be watching your videos and some of the other guys on YouTube. I discovered that there's this difference. And so I was split. You know, I go between the two. And today I'll, I'll visit some traditional uh, Masses whenever I can. Um, it's palatable, the difference in the type of man that visits. I don't know if I'm just making this up, but it seems as if the men that attend traditional masses, even the priests themselves, seem more masculine. What is that? Why is it that uh, either men are attracted, masculine men are attracted to the traditional faith, or there's something there that makes men more manly? So one thing that you'll find in some Novus Ordo parishes, new mass parishes, which you've never found in the history of the church, is called a resurrexifix. It's a cross with the risen Christ coming off of it. Oh. Historically, that was actually seen as sacrilegious. You'll never find that in a traditional church because the cross is where Christ dies. The cross is where Christ voluntarily goes towards the sacrifice. In the new mass, and I did a show on this last night on my channel, my YouTube channel, we talked about the differences between the, the new mass and the old mass. There are four marks, four ends to the mass. I'll see if I can remember them properly. But there's adoration, thanksgiving, propitiation for sin, and petition. There you go. I got them. Adoration, thanksgiving, you see that in both masses. You go to the new mass, you're singing some hymns. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Okay, it's there. And petition, meaning prayer for our needs, blessings and our needs, you see that. 
But what is not obvious in the new Mass is the propitiatory, meaning the sacrificial nature for our sin, our personal sin. So when we go to Mass, the sacrifice is not just a symbol, it's for the remission of our nailing of the 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 nailing of the 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 nails through Christ's wrists that we do when we sin. And this is clear in the old mass. So the reason why men are attracted to the old mass is because the old mass is sacrifice. You don't have to be catechized to see it. You don't have to read a book to see it. You don't have to it doesn't have to be preached to you. You go there and you go, this is the sacrifice. Whereas in the new mass, it's not obvious at all, even if it's technically there. So that's, I think, the biggest reason, because if sacrifice is going to attract men who want to sacrifice. Whereas if you have a liturgy that's based more on feelings, then you're going to attract men who want to feel good. And those are two different type of men. You know, one of the other things I notice when I visit the old mass are a lot of younger people. I see a lot of young families, lots of babies, uh, and, yeah. and young couples. I see young people. And it seems as if uh, this new generation coming up is much more appreciative. Uh, they're, they're hungry for something, and they're very much attracted to the old mass. Um, but it also seems as if there's some pushback and, uh, you know, some of your videos are about how the old mass is being uh, suppressed. Um, w- why would that be the case if it seems to be bringing people back to the faith? It's not logical. Um, you know, again, you got to, there's a, there's a whole history into an in infiltration. I mean, Marshall, Taylor Marshall literally wrote the book, but, you know, um, there's an infiltration of these Freemasonic Marxist humanistic revolutionary ideals that have been into the minds of the human race in general, but they work their way into the church. You know, it's it's very similar to the, our governing class. They're the same age. These basically, I mean, I hate to say the boomer thing and make fun of boomers, right. but like men who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, they're out of touch. They're out of touch. They don't see what the young people actually want. They have this idea of, well, if we get the rock music, the young people right. will come to mass. Mm-hmm. It's like that's that song sounded good in the sixties. It's not. It's not even modern, <laughs> you know. Right. And <laughs> um, and but but also, you know, we saw this for we see this with our leaders, right? You know, here in Canada, we had the freedom convoy against the vaccine mandates and stuff. And a reasonable person, even people that were pro-vaccine. They would say, goodness gracious, can they stop these stupid mandates? Obviously, we don't need this at all, if we ever did. And obviously, the people are not happy about this. And it's causing, can you just, like, they were just like, can you just stop and go back to the way things were? And most Canadians wanted that. But the ruling class, they bet the farm on it. They spent the $27 billion buying enough vaccines for the next seven years or whatever they did. You know, they're throwing the most of them out now because no one's taking them anymore. Um but they bet the farm on it. And the one thing that tyrants can never do is admit they were wrong. <laughs> and sadly, there are some men who've been in charge in the church who have been like that, and they'll, they just won't admit it. Benedict XVI sort of admitted it. You know, he was like, yeah, you know, there was some problems with the way that we've done things, and the old mass is sacred, and it must be allowed. Uh, but Pope Francis, God save him, is just of that very... He's a child of the 60s. You know, he's a he's the first pope we've had who who was ordained into the new mass kind of thing with his age, right? It was the 1960s or 70s became a priest. And and that's just their class right now. And um, yeah, and that's probably why. Do you, of course, nobody can predict the future, but uh, I can only imagine, and I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are, that, um, that it's only going to grow in popularity and that in the, the next few generations, we're going to see a return to tradition in many ways, even outside of the church. You're, you're, we're watching how, you know, um, there, there is a, even if it may be small and I kind of live in a, a bubble myself, but there's a return to tradition. Would you agree that the way forward for humanity, America, you know, the West, men, masculinity is a, is a turning around and going back to the past? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's like society has hit the proverbial rock bottom, you know? I mean, we've got drag queens twerking in front of children at a library. What the hell is going on? You know, and even a normal person goes, I didn't sign up for this. 
Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. even even a person who supports like redefinition of marriage or something is going. That's just because I wanted the guy down the road with his Yorkie to like live with his boyfriend and like thought that was fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not. They're not like I didn't want them to be dancing naked on my lawn. Right. You know, like I didn't sign up for this. And then you start when once you start to ask, once you start to ask a question, you realize, oh, I've got to ask a lot of questions. Um, you know, it's the and and so this you know society itself is it's kind of like red pilling itself. You know. Um, so yeah, tradition. In the sense of everything, I mean, you see this in other. You see this with food. You know, I don't get too much into the the fads for food and stuff, but it's interesting. You know, they're like, we need to eat like our ancestors. We need to eat like our ancestors, and it's like, what did our ancestors know? I thought they were stupid. Right. I thought, I thought were these the were people the people that went to the Crusades, and didn't they all beat their wives? And weren't they all the worst people? Right. Oh, maybe they actually knew how to do things. You know, what else did they know how to do? And so you see this in lots of areas. You're right. Yeah. And so we're coming up in an hour here, and I want to respect your time. I got a lot of young men that are watching my videos. And so, you know, beyond reading your book, which I highly recommend, I tell you it's one of the first books that I picked up when I started exploring the faith. Uh, if, if someone's watching this, a young man's watching this now, and he's intrigued, he's saying, you know what, I, you know, I, I was maybe wrong or I was poorly catechized, didn't know about the, the history of the faith and that the fact is that a, a truly masculine man lives a a Catholic life, where would you tell him to begin? What are some of the things that he could do to maybe reclaim that uh, Catholic masculine edge? Pick up a rosary. Mm. Um, even the most hardened criminal in the world, he can't stand to see his mama cry when they sentence him to go to jail. Don't make your mother cry. Pick up the rosary and develop a deep love for the Blessed Mother because as Christians, we're called to love everything Christ loved. And there's no one who ever lived, who could ever live, who would love Christ more than he did, or should love his mother more than he did. Um, also, the rosary on a practical level, sorrowful mysteries, we meditate on our sins. Joyful mysteries, meditate on our blessings. Glorious mysteries, meditate on our triumphs. And you put those things together and you have a man who's willing to sacrifice, who's willing to live a good life and who's willing to die for what he believes. And that would be my practical advice. I love it. I love it. Kennedy, you're a busy guy, dude. I see you doing a lot of stuff. I see your videos. I see you on other podcasts. I see you doing a bunch of things like writing books and, and uh, uh, you do the voiceover for a lot of books. Where can people learn more about what you're doing, get involved with uh, your, your apostolate, your videos, you know, all the stuff that you're about? Sure. Yeah. So if you go to the Kennedy Report on YouTube, the Kennedy Report, that's my YouTube channel. I do lots of stuff there. And my Twitter, Kennedy Hall, just at Kennedy Hall. And I am a journalist for LifeSite News. So if you go to LifeSite News, you'll see my you know, multiple articles there a day. Um, I also write for Crisis Magazine and I write for 1 Peter 5. Um, and I have a new book coming out in about three weeks to a month, God willing, defending the Society of St. Pius X, which is a whole other conversation yeah maybe we'll get and, you back on to talk about that sure and um you can yeah if, if twitter honestly i just i'm i'm on twitter way too much so <laughs> you go to, at kennedy hall and you'll find my stuff amazing kennedy thank you so much brother thank you you got it and you guys stay strong god bless until next time done if you're a high achieving businessman executive or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking drugs overeating or any filthy vice Here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.